Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Jerry Paleo, as Patty has said, and uh, we've got a very jam-packed 90-minute session today, uh, focusing on mastering HR in a department of one. And I think part of the problem, the reason why I use this image, is that if you're an HR department of one, you tend to be Superman or Superwoman and wonder how you're going to get everything done. But the problem, of course, is how do you get things done? How do you present great results without burning out and then not being able to do anything. So um, I'm going to give you a, a lot of tips. And what we're going to be talking about is, hold on, there we go. Uh, we're going to be talking about six things in the next 90 minutes. We're going to be talking about how the pandemic changed everything. A lot of companies are trying to go back to business as usual, but unfortunately, we cannot go back to business as usual. Um, also, I found an interesting article, and I thought this really uh, discussed the HR function. We used to be undervalued in an organization, and then the pandemic hit, and now we're all totally overwhelmed with all the things that need to be done, especially with the younger generations coming into the workplace. Uh, we're then going to get a little bit more specific uh, to identify what your stressors are. Um, and if you're stressed out, you're not going to be able to perform as well as you would like to. We're then going to be talking about this alignment of strategy, priorities, and processes so that you don't get caught up every day in the minutia. Most important thing we're going to be talking about is how to set and keep those boundaries, because I'm sure all of you have 100 people coming in your office saying, I need help right now. And it can be tough to get your own work done. And then finally, we're going to talk about how to reduce stress and avoid burnout. So as I said in the beginning, uh, the business as usual ship has sailed. Not only did the pandemic change the way people view work, but also we've got a younger generation who is not going to be putting in the hours and having that blind loyalty that the older generations had. Um, now, this is a good thing, and it's also a bad thing. And we're going to be talking a little bit more about that. But when we talk about, you know, the end of business as usual, um, this quote by Jordan Turner back in 2023, I think, really uh, describes what's happening within the workplace uh, in terms of employees. Uh, the era of the employment contract, where a worker provided services purely in exchange for monetary compensation, is over. Employees now expect deeper relationships, a strong sense of community, and purpose-driven work. And if you've taken any um, classes or courses or watched videos by Tony Robbins or some of the other motivational speakers, they've always been saying this is what you look for in work and what you uh, really want. But after the pandemic, employees are now expecting this. And if they don't feel that they have deep relationships and a sense of community and that there's a real purpose in their work, they're going to leave. Uh, job candidates may ghost you, but the biggest fear is that some of your star performers, if they don't feel the relationships, the community, and the purpose-driven work, they're going to leave too. And that can cause havoc for a small company. So during the post-pandemic, employees are asking three key questions. One, what makes me happy and whole? Two, what truly satisfies me? And I think probably the key word in this question is truly, not what, what did I used to say satisfied me, but what truly satisfies me as a whole person. And then finally, where have I given away too much of myself for very little in return? Any of these questions sound familiar to you? Have you been asking yourself these questions also? Oh, I see. I see. Heather is is nodding. Um, yes, and I also see Donna that you're busily taking notes. And what I'll do is I'll be sending the PowerPoint slide deck to everybody after this is over, because I kind of go fast, and your hand's going to cramp up. <laughs> okay. So, um, you know, as I said, employees need a sense of purpose. And there was a study conducted by Gartner, which I, who I really like. And these are the basic statements where people say, you know, do they fully uh, agree with this down to not agree with it? Well, only 45% of employees believe that their employer saw them as a person, 
rather than a cog in a wheel or a replaceable commodity. But 82% felt that it's important that my employer sees me as a person. So there's a big disconnect here between what they want versus what they're actually experiencing. And in the post-pandemic uh, work, uh, workplace, you need to put the human back into human resources. Now, all of you are HR professionals, and we've been screaming about this for years. But the problem is most of you are overworked, especially in, if you're in a department of one. And how do you do all of the administrative work and still create the warm fuzzies for the employees and the developmental opportunities. And usually senior managers go just get the administrative stuff done and all this other stuff that engages employees. Yeah, that's not that important. But as we all know, if you don't have an engaged workforce, you do not have a company that's going to succeed. So there are system some systemic truths about this future of work. First, it's that employees are people. They're not just workers. This means that we have uh, outside interests, outside demands, and we have unique needs and desires that may or may not be fulfilled by work alone. And therefore, work is just a subset of life. It's not separate from life. And I think prior to the pandemic, there was a lot of workaholism going on that your work was everything. Well, during the pandemic, we started realizing, oh, we can change the way we work. We can still get stuff done. And wow, I can have a personal life too. And I can have relationships. And finally, the value that employees feel comes through their feelings, not just the features. And when you start getting into the soft, squishy feeling stuff, that's where it gets difficult. And so we're going to be talking about, you know, how we can great, create a great work environment for employees in a way that you can get your work done without burning out. So this new employee experience um, means that employees want meaningful work. They want empowerment and voice. Now, empowerment, I love that term when it came out. But what empowerment usually ended up meaning was, I'm going to give you more work to do. Not going to give you a new uh, job title, not going to give you more money, but I'm empowering you to do more. Well, what we found in the pandemic is that is really not what empowerment means. Uh, it requires a sense of autonomy. It requires a sense of trust within the organization. The new employee experience also requires feedback and recognition and growth opportunities, especially for this younger generation, these uh, Gen Zs that are coming into the workplace, they need a lot of this. I teach at various universities and um, I, I was just teaching a, a course at Walsh University. I've never seen such quiet students in my life. And they, they, they were, I think they were fearful. But then I gave a one-on-one -on -one with them when I did graded their reports. And when I said to, to the ones who deserved it, you did a great job, their faces lit up. And they were like, thank you, thank you. And then they started opening up. And what happened was in the classroom, they started participating more. It's the same thing in a workplace. If you provide feedback and recognition and growth opportunities, the employees will share more, be more open and be more motivated to do great work. Also, the new employee experience is focusing on co-worker relationships. As we all know, the number one reason why employees leave is because they're having trouble with their boss. It's a personal thing. doesn't matter how great the company is. It's even worse if they're having conflicts with their co-workers. It also requires organizational trust. And trust uh, takes a long time to be earned but you can lose it in a minute. So creating and maintaining that organizational trust is critical for the new employee experience. Mm -hmm. And then finally, it's also work-life balance. And that's, I think, the, one of the big takeaways from the pandemic. So when you look at this whole thing about what the new employee experience is, motiva motivation, <laughs> if everybody could uh, mute know, themselves, please. If everybody can mute themselves. Um, 
motivation has never been more important. Now, there's a couple things about motivation. First of all, you can't motivate anybody. Motivation is an internal state. I can inspire people, but usually people, uh, and in business, they don't want to use the word inspiration. It sounds a little bit too um, religious or spiritual. So we call it motivation. This is good old Abraham Maslow. And Maslow's hierarchy of needs was uh, created in 1943 and then updated in 1954. So this thing has been around for a long time, okay? What he says is that is what is necessary to change a person is to change his awareness of self. And I'm sure you're all familiar with Maslow's hierarchy. You have to fulfill the physiological needs, then you have to make them feel safe, they have to feel a sense of belonging. It builds their self-esteem. And then eventually they get to that self-actualization where they become high performers and not overachievers. Now, to piggyback on that, um, you know, with this, motivation is internal. To piggyback on this is Hertzberg. And Hertzberg came up, came up with the motivator hygiene theory back in 1959. And what he said is that a reward once it's given, becomes a right. So the first time you acknowledge someone, they're rocking and rolling, they're happy. But then they expect it. It's now a right and it's something that they demand. If you look at the hygiene factors, these are things like pay, their status, security, the working conditions, all the fringe bennies, the policies and administrative practices, as well as the interpersonal relationship, relationships. These are expected, and in the post-pandemic era, they are really expected. But they don't necessarily lead to satisfaction in and of themselves. That's the easy stuff. You know, the pay, the status, you can do benchmarks against other organizations, you know, try to do things in the working conditions. But what motivates people and has them put in the extra effort are these motivators. These are what creates uh, job satisfaction, meaningful work, challenging work, recognition, feelings of achievement, increased responsibility that they want, not necessarily that you keep throwing at them, opportunities for growth, and then the job itself. And so what Hertzberg came up with is that it's internal and it's external. Now, if you look at what the motivators are, this is a lot of what people were questioning during the pandemic, right? This is part of that new employee experience. So they started blending Maslow and, and, Hertz, and Hertzberg, um, and then um, Theory X and Theory Y. So the hygiene factors are belonging and social needs. That's the highest one. The work safety and the basic physiological needs. So the basic physiological needs, you know, you're talking about things like the pay you know, the things that make it a safe workplace, the things that quite frankly are required by law. But what's the unique sauce to really make your organization an organization that is uh, an employer of choice, that people want to work for you and that people want to stay with you are these motivators. That's not legislated. I don't think that can be legislated. But having that sense of esteem for themselves and others, as well as actualization. So what the, the reason why I say all this is that everybody wants and needs motivators. We all want it, right? And it's the HR's opportunity to create the foundation for all employees to be motivated, not just the employees that you're working for, but also for you. And there is the rub. According to People Spheres in 2024, HR's operational focus could be due to the pressure, usually by senior leaders, for the administrative duty, duties and the compliance activities. I will tell you that AI is coming into HR and it's going to be taking over, I believe, a lot of these things. But that's good. Because currently, that operational focus leaves little time for the relationship building, the mentorship, and the talent development. And that's the stuff that HR really excels in when they have the time. 
So if you think about it, we're in a, in a transition period where HR could be purely administrative and the relationship building and the mentorship and the talent development. OK, that's nice. But who has time for it? Now it's shifting with technology and the changing demands of the workplace that HR is in that unique role to create a fantastic environment for the workforce and themselves. But it's not your imagination. <laughs> HR's fried. So many things that are that are going on, um, so many administrative issues, so many challenges with different generations. Um, and if you're an HR department of one, nobody to delegate it to. So this is where HR has gone from being undervalued to now feeling overwhelmed. And since you're taking uh, this workshop, I'm assuming that some of you are feeling a little bit overwhelmed, especially as an HR department of one. So I have a question. I have, and you can uh, put this in the chat or you can uh, just call it out. What area of your job is the most overwhelming to you? Is it the recruitment of trying to find qualified candidates? Is it retention or is it employee engagement? Or is it all that legal compliance and all that stuff? What do you think? And you can either put it in the chat. Okay, we got some things going in the chat. Okay. Uh, ah, compliance. Got it. Compliance. Engagement and retention. Huge, huge issue. Um, I've worked with a lot of manufacturers, and they're just screaming about this. Um, that, you know, they have higher job candidates, and sometimes they ghost them and never show up. Uh, I'm sure that's in other industries also. Or they just work for 30 days and they're gone. Um, compliance, recruitment, and engagement are tied. Yes, Chris, absolutely. It's a circle in there. If you've got engaged employees, they're not going to turn over, so you don't need to go out and try to recruit new ones. Uh, compliance, uh, employee engagement, recruiting and engagement. So I think what's important with this is recognizing that it's going to be different for everyone. What overwhelms you might not necessarily be the same thing that overwhelms somebody else, even though you mo both might be HR departments of one. So let me ask you a question. Okay, yeah, I like Pirates of Penzance. Yeah, I like Johnny Depp. We're not going to get into all the lawsuits and everything else. But I want to ask you, what kind of a pirate are you? So take a look at this little graphic. As you can see, there's all kinds of little stick figures here. One of them is throwing up. One of them is, gra uh, is holding on for dear life. One of them is checking it, checking out and off on an island. Another one is feeling like, oh, my God, I'm not going to be able to catch anything. Uh, this one's going to wants to sabotage everything. So going into the chat, which pirate best represents who you are currently? in regard to your HR workload. Okay, we've got the number four. Okay, 15. <laughs> Pushing back, okay. Number two. Okay, let me just move this over here. Number six, steering the ship, great. And a little bit of two, looking in the future, fantastic, fantastic. So we've got some people in here who are being very progressive and moving forward. But I have another question. Which pirate you'd, would you be if the powers that be assigned you even more responsibilities? Okay. Okay. Kind of fearful. Okay. Uh, let's see. Where is 17? <laughs> Wanting to blow the whole thing up. I love it. Okay. Holding on for dear life. Okay. 
I like to laugh about that. Yeah, I love this this graphic. Um, what I found with this pirate is I, I used this when I was working with a company on some pretty delicate issues that nobody's going to come right out and say how they feel. But there's a little bit of protection in this. So uh, let me know if you want a copy of it, if you want to do it for any of your training or anything else. So again, it sounds like uh, overall the consensus is Okay, I you know, right now I feel like I can steer the ship, but if you give me any more, that's going to be the tipping point of the straw that broke the camel's back. And are any of you feeling burned out? Because if you're burning out, you're not alone. Um, in pulling this workshop together, I did some research and I was pretty shocked by what I found out. 95% of HR leaders find working in HR to be overwhelming due to excessive workload and stress. 95%. That's huge. That's absolutely huge. And then 84% of HR leaders frequently experience stress and about 81% feel burned out. And we're going to be talking about burnout uh, a little bit later. Uh, top challenge for 90% of HR leaders is limited budgets. How many of you have that issue? They want you to do more with increasingly less. And about the same amount, or 89%, identified inadequate resources as the number one challenge. When I did my research on burnout during organizational change, which uh, culminated in the burnout during organizational change model, or BDOC, Inadequate resources was one of the top 10 reasons why people were burning out, okay? 73% um, of HR leaders tend to prioritize the processes over the people. You have to have good processes in place, but sometimes what's happened, especially when you're overwhelmed, dealing with one more emotional employee is just way, way too much. So let's kind of hide and just focus on processes and let's not deal with the human part of human resources. And half of the HR uh, professionals that were interviewed are on the verge of quitting. And the reason they were on the verge of quitting was because they were burned out. So these are some very sobering statistics on HR. Just as HR is becoming more critical for a company to succeed, HR leaders are burning out, they're overwhelmed, and they're fried. Now, this I thought was very interesting. Laszlo Bach is the co-founder and co-faculty director of the Berkeley Transformative CHRO Academy, but he was the former SVP of People Ops at Google. And what he said is the team that cares for the rest of the employees, which is HR, is often the first team that gets impacted or burned out. And if you're burned out, you are not going to be able to lead others. Your problem-solving abilities deteriorate, your decision-making deteriorates, and you get really, really cranky. So let me ask you, who in here has felt, felt burned out? And you can just put it in the chat. Anybody feel burned out? Or would you like the little pirates instead? <laughs> I like that, Patty. Well, here's the problem. When you're burned out, you can feel vulnerable. You can feel endangered. And then eventually, you become extinct. It's called burnout for a reason. Uh, when Freudenberger just, uh, identified the burnout phenomenon, he was a Freudian psychoanalyst in New York City, he called it burnout because what he discovered was the, the people who were experiencing this were like burned out shells of buildings. The outside was there, but inside it was all dead. And when I've interviewed people who have experienced a full-blown burnout, that's what it's like. There's There's actually no reason to go on. It's very, very frustrating. So let's talk about what your stressors are, because when you're an HR department of one, you got a lot of stress on you. You know, uh, take time off because you're sick. Who's going to handle the workload? You know, being busy with a, a major product uh, project and then something happens with an employee. 
that takes you off course. So let's identify your, your stressors. The first thing to understand is what is a stressor? A stressor is a situation or an event. It can be something internal that you're experiencing or external, but it causes a very personal stress response. You stress, that's, a good, that's the uh, good stuff. It's the positive stress response that tends to invigorate you. Um, you've, you've worked a long time and you're going to compete in a marathon. You're stressed, but it's, it's an exciting stress. In contrast, distress is a negative stress response that debilitates you. A lot of times you implode or you act out or lash out. But it's important to remember that the stressor or the stress is inherently neutral. It's all in how you perceive it. And if you look at this little image that I have of the kitten looking in the mirror and seeing a, a powerful lion, this is what I think a lot of HR professionals are. We put a front on because we have to take care of the employees, but in reality, we're dealing with our own issues. And a lot of times it's a fear of even asking for any help or ask for help, who's going to do it, okay? But I, you have to realize that your response is uh, to stress is often based on uh, six different personality types who are at risk. So I'm wondering, which one are you? How about the overachiever? I'm not talking about a high achiever. A high achiever knows when it's enough and they've met the standards. The overachiever keeps pushing too hard, too long, and they often have a un very unrealistic goal. Uh, the overachievers are not what you want. You also don't want to hire the overachievers. Secondly are the perfectionists. Okay, I'm, I'm a reformed perfectionist. And I realized that it had gotten out of control when I was designing a flyer and I was moving a margin one sixteenth of an inch back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And then there was the good Jerry and the bad Jerry on your shoulders and the bad Jerry was like, make it perfect, make it perfect. The good Jerry was like, if someone's not going to hire you because your margin is off by a sixteenth of an inch, you don't want them as a client. So that's why I say I'm a reformed perfectionist. But perfectionists are very rigid. They have self-defeating standards of excellence. The problem with perfectionism is it's tied to procrastination, which creates even more stress. What about people pleasers? A lot of people go into HR because they really enjoy working with other people. But sometimes if it extends into people pleasing, it indicates a low level of confidence, and oftentimes it's very unexpressed frustration. If you have an employee who's a people pleaser, love working with them, and then they just blow up. They don't know why, but the sweet little person has now turned into a, an irate maniac. People pleasing puts you at risk for burnout because you're not being true to yourself. The denier, the denier is the one who sugarcoats it often hides behind humor. <laughs> yeah, oh, well, I'm, I'm working, you know, 10 hours every day, seven days a week, but oh, I can rest when I die. That's the denier. It's not acknowledging what it is that you're feeling. The loner. Now, some of you may say, I am an HR department of one. I have to do this alone. Well, you can also get help from other managers, which we'll talk about that a little bit later. But the loner absolutely avoids asking for help and often avoids accepting that help. This can go back into the perfectionist who is, why should I ask anybody to help me? Because they're not gonna be able to do it right. And then there's the single tasker. The single tasker um, you know, is unable to see that big picture. You know, it's just focused like this. So this is, you know, uh, who is it in, in ancient Rome that the guy was fiddling and all of Rome was burning around him? That's the single tasker, just focused on one thing and ignoring everything else. But I also know that when you're in, in an HR department of one, you may even crave being able to single task, but you have all these other things to do. So if you're you're burning out and overwhelmed, sometimes you'll go into that single task mode because you don't have to deal with all this other stuff that's coming up. 
but Rome is burning and you're going to have to deal with it anyways. Now, the, you know, does any of this sound familiar? What do I have in the chat here? Okay. Anybody, um, does it, do any of these sound familiar to maybe who you are? But let's take a look at something else here. It's important for you to remember two things. If you burn out, there's a lot of denial in burnout. There's a sense of failure if you feel like you're burning out. But burnout is not an individual's maladaptive response to stress. Workplace practices are critical in employee burnout. Now, we've there are the six at-risk personalities, but it's not just that that leads you to burnout. It can be your organization. In my research on, um, you know, led to the BDOC model, what I found is that, and these are ranked in order of frequency in the people whom I interviewed. Many people think the work overload is the big reason for burnout. It's number seven on the list. The top reason why um, employees burn out was poor leadership. Uh, it or a feeling that there is a lack that the organization really cares about you. Now, the thing that's interesting with that is with HR, we're the, the liaison uh, or the intermediary between the employees and the workforce and the uh, organizational strategy or the corporate leaders. And sometimes I worked with one company who said, we bend over backwards for our employees. Well, I did an employee engagement survey and let's put it this way, they shot the messenger. They were like, how can you say this? Everybody who took this survey lied. Well, that told me there was no trust in the organization. But poor leadership, a lack of organizational caring, negative coworkers, politics or sabotage, um, a lack of resources, which we mentioned earlier, overemphasis on the ROI, focus on the processes. We don't, yeah, that's the hard stuff. Business is about the hard stuff. It's not about the soft, squishy stuff with people. Well, I got news for you. Your employees are your company's only non-duplicatable competitive advantage. Your competitors can reverse engineer everything you do. They cannot reverse engineer your people. Um, the work overload, poor communication, uh, that can really be fixed by having good systems in place. The unethical or illegal requests that my participants share with me would make your hair curl, believe me. And then finally, having no vision or direction. So if you feel like uh, you've been burning out, do any of these things sound familiar to you that you're seeing in your own organization? Anything? Okay, hold on. Oh, dear. Bouncing between all of them. Okay. Okay. Got it. Yeah, there's a lot going on. So if you have these these six at-risk personalities in an environment that contains one or more of these, not only are you going to burn out, but also your employees are going to burn out. And now when employees burn out, particularly the younger generation, when they feel overwhelmed, they leave, which adds more stress to you because you now have to go into recruiting again. And if you see that that the people in your workplace are overwhelmed and they're not meeting performance standards and they're missing deadlines, now you got a retention issue. And then you try to engage them and it's like, we don't want to talk to you. And it just keeps expanding, expanding and expanding and makes it very, very difficult. But now I want to, we've, we've talked about this background. Now I want to share more of what we can do to move forward. The first thing is to focus on strategy, priorities, and processes. Um, I have been a solopreneur since God created it all. I mean, literally, I started when I was in high school, okay, many, many, many moons ago. And what I found is that you can get overwhelmed by the daily stuff, and then suddenly the key strategic priorities just go to the wayside and you end up feeling like you're stuck in mud. So we're gonna talk about strategy, priorities, and processes. Now, culture plays a critical role, okay? Um, but you know, what, what the heck is culture? 
you know, culture is one of these words, and I've seen this not so much with HR professionals, but with senior leaders. They can't really define what culture is. Uh, in the post-pandemic era, as we're moving out of the remote work and the hybrid, many senior leaders are saying employees have to come back into the workplace because this is how you build a team and this is what helps. Despite the fact that there have been numerous studies that have shown that, no, just bringing people back into the office does not build a culture or a good culture. So culture is that collection of, and look at how squishy these things are, values, beliefs, ethics that characterize an organization, but most importantly, what's often forgotten is that it guides its practices. It's how we do things here, okay? Now, culture is how you do what you do within the workplace. And it's critical to define what is an ideal culture and make sure that that's aligned with these strategic goals. I see a disconnect a lot of times with companies. Also, this idea of engagement, what's, what's another way to, to define engagement? Uh, some companies defined it as employees who will work without complaint 50, 60 hours a week because time, the amount of time indicates engagement. But a better definition is it's the involvement and the enthusiasm. See how it's this soft, squishy stuff again. The involvement and enthusiasm of employees in their work and in their workplace, whether they're remote, hybrid, or on site. Now, what you have to realize is the level of engagement is going to affect the culture because how involved and enthusiastic employees are is going to affect the values, their beliefs, their ethics, and their attitudes. And then the retention also leads back into the engagement, but more importantly, the retention affects the culture. In working with companies, I found that many frontline workers uh, or supervisors are really stressed out and angry because there's such turnover of new employees, you know, within 30 to 90 days. Oftentimes, they're training these new employees um, in a one-to-one -one situation, and then the employee leaves. And they got to do it all over again. And they're frustrated because they can't do what their job is. So the bottom line here is with culture, engaged employees tend to perform better and they stay with the company. And it not only creates that culture, but it also sustains that culture, okay? Now, uh, according to an Inspira study uh, and a forecast study, HR professionals can and should be integral in developing a, a company's business strategy. Now think about that. This is not the C-suite coming to you and going, these are our strategic goals. Make sure HR is aligned with it. But HR needs to have a seat at the table when the corporate leaders are creating their business strategy. And they're integral in developing that strategy because they're aligning their HR initiatives with the goals and objectives of the organization. So HR, as I said, is that missing link OK, between the employees and the achievement of corporate goals. Now, the HR strategy is really focusing on two areas, uh, the cultural factors and the core competencies. This is a model that I've created that really does help keep things aligned. And in an HR department of one, it's a way of ensuring that you're going to be focusing on what really matters and in business speak, that's going to get the biggest return for a uh, bang for the buck and return on the investment. Because if you can show that return on investment, then the sweet C suite is going to be supporting you in what you're doing. Okay. Rather than, Oh, that's nice. It's soft and squishy. So we look first at the strategic goals. Um, and these have to be aligned with the organizational strategy or what I call the big kahuna. Uh, too often I see corporations, when I'm working with them on strategy, they have 10 different things they want to accomplish, and they all want to have them accomplished in six months. That ain't a strategy. Strategies should be going three to five years. Uh, 
It used to be before technology uh, and the speed of, of communication increased so much. It used to be 10 to 15 years for strategy, then broken down into operational goals and then daily tactics. But what I've found is if you have a big kahuna overarching goal that is the, the number one thing you need to do, there'll be three strategic goals that if you meet them, that ensures that you achieve the big kahuna goal. Now, let's have a couple of examples. It could be um, a continuous uh, engagement with key stakeholders. That can be a strategic goal. Notice it's not a uh, one thing to accomplish. Continuous engagement can encompass a lot of different things. And then you can get into the sub goals depending on the department. Or it could be a new product launch. What all is involved with that? When it comes to cultural factors, these can be things like accountability teamwork, efficient project management. These are all factors of the culture or how we do things here. Some companies are uh, focused on innovation. Some companies are more focused on um, the, the quality of their current products. Some companies foster uh, kind of a maverick approach that employees can go off and do their own thing, while other companies say we work as a team. You have to identify what those key cultural factors are that create the environment that will ensure that the strategic goals will be achieved. And the way that you sustain the culture is through these core competencies. Um, I was working with a, a large Fortune 300 company and the VP of HR said, well, one of our core competencies is they have to have a degree. I said, what does that mean? Trust me, I've got like three graduate degrees. Having a graduate degree in and of itself doesn't mean anything, okay? But what were they really trying to get at? What they were trying to get at was they needed business acumen, okay? Very, very different from having to have a college degree, okay? So core competencies also are these soft skills. And again, that's what makes it so difficult. So this can be creativity, someone who's a self-starter. And all of these things then lead into sustaining the culture that you have created that will ensure that the company can achieve its strategic goals. These all have to be aligned. Now, uh, let me give you an example. Uh, this was with uh, an academic uh, organization that I worked with. And this is what they came up with. Their big kahuna goal was to be recognized as a premier pioneer in academic innovation. When we were crafting this big kahuna, they said, we want to be recognized as the premier uh, academic innovator. And I said, okay. And they looked at me and went, well, no, that's great. I said, how's it make you feel? Okay, I said, and then the, the CEO said, what about a pioneer? Now it changes things. Recognized as a premier pioneer in academic innovation. The pioneer and the innovation are aligned. If you're a pioneer, you're looking to a distant shore that you may not know where it is or what's actually there. So what do they need to do? The key strategic goals were to increase the academic rigor and achievement to engage in uh, continuously engage with those key st stakeholders. So you get more ideas and more innovation. And the big thing was to operationalize their processes for expansion, because if they're going to be a pioneer, they're going to be expanding. And then the cultural factors had to be consistent innovation, two-way communication, not communication. They originally wanted to say communication. I said, no, 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 no. I'm talking at you. That's not communication. It's got to be two-way. Um, having flexibility and adaptability. If you're innovating, you're going to have to shift and pivot. To have accountability and self-initiative. To have mutual trust and respect. And then the competencies that they were look looking at in all of their employees, and it would be at different levels of mastery depending on the job, were creativity, confidence, and trust. If they have those within the creativity within their discipline, they're confident in what they know, and they trust and are open with others, it will work. So 
that's just kind of an idea of how those things can be aligned. And so we talked before about the 10 ways that organizations create the burnout. This is how you transform them so that you start building resiliency, okay? Not only for the workplace, but for yourself. Having servant leadership with trust and autonomy rather than poor leadership. Uh, providing tangible proof of caring and support. Talking to employees. What is it that they need? Talking to yourself in an HR department of one. What do you need to feel that you're cared for and supported? Having positive collaborative teams, honest, fair, equitable treatment of all. There we go into compliance issues. Asking and striving to provide what's needed instead of having a lack of resources. Having balanced performance metrics so that you're not overly focused on ROI. Manageable workloads don't work over 60 hours per week. Now, some of you may say, but I have to to get it done. We're next going to be talking about how to prioritize the HR operations. Um, having ongoing two-way dialogue. Having a zero tolerance for ethical violations to replace the unethical or illegal requests that lead to burnout. And then finally, having participative management to build the vision and creating a vision that people can all commit to. So these are, the reason why I'm doing it this way is you have to know what your priorities are within the HR department. Um, that's aligned with the strategies. And then you have to build some processes. So here's some tips I want to give you to prioritize your HR ops to determine what's important and what needs to get done. And quite frankly, what stuff you can get rid of. First thing, everything is not critical. If you think everything is critical that you do, you're going to run around like chicken little. You know, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, and you're not going to be able to get anything done. You need to prioritize and complete the task based on their alignment to the strategic goals as well as the urgency. Prioritizing can be difficult, but it's making a decision in terms of what needs to be done and what needs to, uh, what's going to get the biggest bang for the buck what's going to help move HR and move the company forward. And realize, you know, you got time. You know, you may say you don't, but you do have time. If you try to do everything at once, at the end of a quarter, nothing's going to be completed fully, okay? Or you're going to rush to get something done at the end. It's better to really focus on what it is that needs to be done. What are the most critical tasks based on their alignment to strategy, okay? Second thing to, to prioritize your HR op is to use SMART goals, uh, which are specific, measurable, achievable, results-driven, and time-bound. SMART goals um, are one of the easiest, the most simple ways of doing, the creating goals, but until you get the hang of it, it's not easy. When you have a SMART goal, if I say, Okay, we need to redo the HR department. How specific is that? It's not, right? Uh, what specifically do you need to do? We need to organize all the filing. Okay. Um, how much filing is there? Can it be done? Because some things you might have a goal that an HR department of one you can't do by yourself. So you may need to uh, tell the senior leaders uh, to bring other people in to help. Results driven. So what? Why are we doing this goal? Why do we have this goal in the first place? If you can't identify the results that are going to be achieved, you're not going to be motivated to do it. You're not going to put the time in. It's like, because I'm doing all this stuff and so what? How is this going to make a difference? And also with the goal, it needs to be time bound. There needs to be a time frame for, to get it done. One thing I will tell you is make sure you've got wiggle room. I've been doing this for years. I estimate how much time each project is going to take and each specific step in a project. When you first start out, you're way off. You think it's going to take a lot less time than it actually takes. But as you become uh, more aware of how you work, you're going to realize how long something takes. So when a manager comes to you and says, I need this, 
if, and if you've done it before, you can say, okay, this is how much time it's going to take me. So if the manager says, but I need it by tomorrow morning, now we go into the results driven. So what, why do you need it by tomorrow? If it's urgent, then you kind of have to stop other things in order to do that. But use SMART goals to prioritize um, your the projects and your ops. Strive for a one and done. Touch each document or a step in a process only once. Start using automation to file stuff, to document stuff, to give you reminders. I had a friend who did, uh, who was an HR director, and she refused technology. So she had whiteboards all over her office. And I said, you got a copy of them? She said, what? I said, what if cleaning comes in and decides to wash all the whiteboards? What's going to happen? This one and done is a really good technique because too often stuff comes in and you put it off because you don't have time now and you forget about it until the deadline is very, very near, usually because you're reminded by the person who needed you to do it. So strive for a one and done. If you don't have other people to delegate it to, use automation so that things are done immediately for you. Think of your automation as your assistant. Uh, don't reinvent the wheel. Uh, reuse document sections, slide decks, and processes. You know, see how you can modify them slightly or tweak them so that you can use them for other things. And establish and maintain time blocks for important uh, and routine tasks. Um, notify your stakeholders of when you're going to have these time blocks. And what's most important is why you need this time to concentrate going back into the desired results or the with them, what's in it for me. Um, a lot of times managers will become more realistic and more understanding if you say, look, I have to get this project done. And I'm, I've am i decided I'm doing a Friday morning from 9 a.m. to 12 noon. I'm not going to be available at that time. Don't just close your door and expect people to psychically realize that you're unavailable. Notify people that you'll be in the office, but you won't be available between 9 and 12 because you're working on this project, which is important because people will usually respect it. And then finally, um, get organized. That's probably one of the most important things. Um, if you have to, hire an intern to come in and help getting the files up to date. There is a lot of time that is lost when you can't find files. Uh, it takes you off uh, out of your focus on getting something done. It can take anywhere from, it can take up to 20 minutes to get back on task. So get organized. Okay, now I know what you're going to say. Oh, come on, Jerry. That's just too much to do. You know, I've got recruiting, I've got retaining, I've got engaging employees. How do you expect me to do all this stuff? Well, this is where we go to the next part, which is setting and keeping those boundaries. But I know everybody wants HR right now. I got a question I expect to be answered immediately. So we're going to bring Johnny Depp back in here. What kind of a pirate are you? So which pirate are you if a manager demands an answer right this very moment? Which pirate are you? And you can just put the number in the chat. Oh, be quiet. There we go. Okay, two. Okay, looking ahead. Ten. Okay, kind of like clean the decks. Like, okay, one more thing that has to be done. Uh, steering the ship. Okay, just keep on what's going on. Little bit scary there. Okay, keep on climbing up that, up the slog. Moving forward. Okay, good. <laughs> so this can be be difficult okay so let me ask you a question i'm going to do another one of these which pirate are you when you have to discipline an employee this gets into the tough stuff which pirate are you when you have to discipline an employee oh god yeah yeah, I usually tell people I'm really good in the heat of battle. 
I throw up afterwards, but in the heat of battle, I'm really, really good. And it's difficult. Yeah. Because a lot of times you feel like, uh, you know, uh, I had, when I first started teaching at a university, I said to a friend of mine who had taught in middle school, I said, I feel really bad because I gave this kid an F. And he said, stop that. You didn't give a student anything. It's what they earned. If you have good processes in place and you've got a good feedback mechanism in place that the employee knows what needs to be done and how it needs to be done, then you didn't give it to them. They earned it. You can still be compassionate, though. Okay, seven uh, or 13, the bearer of bad news. Oh, I'm so sorry, Heather. I'm sorry. So, you know, it, it is difficult when you have to discipline employees. And some managers will do the discipline or some managers say, go to HR. HR can handle it because they probably feel like number 14, too, that they're throwing up. So final question here. Which pirate are you if you're having a difficult conversation with an employee? It can be a line worker. It can be a manager. It can be your boss. Which pirate are you when you have di those difficult conversations? Okay, climbing up. Okay, 18. Oh, God, I feel like you're drowning. Okay, climbing up. One, okay, six with everyone but my boss. Oh, Chris, I'd love to know more about that. Yeah, the difficult conversations are challenging because I think, especially in HR, you don't want to be the bearer of bad news. You know, you don't want to um, have these types of, of uh, conversations. And a lot, you know, most people don't like conflict. Uh, I was working with uh, one guy, Six Sigma Black Belt, and very, you know, pushing things forward until we had to have a conversation. And I realized this guy was so conflict adverse, it was terrible. And as a result, a lot of things were going wrong, that the left hand didn't know what the right hand was doing. So difficult conversations are common. I'm going to share a secret with you. When you're dealing with all of these types of things and setting up boundaries, you have to say no. Now, um, I know as women, we were usually taught, or I was, no is a dirty word. You can't say no. You're in HR. You're supposed to like people. So you can't say no to requests. There's that superwoman, superman complex going on to say no. But if you say yes to one thing, you got to say no to something else. So if you say yes to a last minute request, you have to say no to getting other more important tasks done. But it's not easy. Um, there's a couple reasons why it's tough to say no. First can be a fear of disappointing others. But saying no does not mean you're rejecting someone or their request. It's worse to say yes to something and then not be able to get it done. Another reason it's why it's tough to say no is a desire for approval and validation. But you have to realize, and this can be very tough, and I've seen this a lot with HR professionals, your ability to meet their demands, demands does not solely determine your worth, okay? Um, if, some, if the CEO asks me to do something, I have to do it. Well, how important is it? Can you do it? Can it be done well? Are you the best person to do it? Have a conversation with them. Uh, saying no can be, um, it's tough to say no because saying no is viewed as being very unselfish or impolite. You need to redefine your values and priorities based on your well-being. So if you believe is that if you say no, See, I'm do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I'm unselfish. If I do say no, I'm being impolite. That's not right. So you have to redefine your values and priorities based on your well-being. The reason why I say that is saying yes to every request means you're going to have less and less time to do what's really important in your job. And then finally, it can be guilt and obligation. You know, and prioritizing your own needs is acceptable. You have to remember that. 
you know, I feel that I have to do this. I'm an HR department of one. All of this is resting on my shoulders. I have to do this. No, you don't. You can't do it all, but you can do what are your key strategic priorities. That's the important thing. And the other reason why it's tough to say no is saying no can create an impasse. And I think that's what a lot of people feel like they want to throw up or hide when they're having a, a difficult conversation. So here's some ways to respond to six major causes of impasses. The first thing is a perception of being attacked. Okay. This is that you're feeling this way or the person you're talking to. Ask them these questions. Why do you believe my idea won't work? And then shut up. Why do you believe it won't work? That's going to get down to what the root problem is and not a symptom. Also, if you feel like you're being attacked, what if I say, or they feel that you're attacking them? And this often happens in a difficult conversation, particularly regarding performance. Well, what have I said to make you feel that way? Sometimes it can be a misunderstanding. Another impasse is when those discussions meander off course. And it's like you're starting to talk about this and then it goes all these other places and you end up at a point where you didn't expect. What are we trying to accomplish? Be just very direct. What are we trying to accomplish? What are we hoping to get out of this to keep things on track? It aligns with that strategy and prioritization, okay? Because if it is a priority to achieve a strategic goal, then it's the best interest of HR, the employee, and the organization as a whole to get it done. Sometimes there's just poor rapport between parties. Ask for their opinion. A lot of times people feel that they're not being listened to. Uh, what ideas do you have? Make sure that communication is two-way. Understand where they're coming from. Another impasse is sometimes you're at a loss for words. When somebody comes up with someone and you're like, I don't know where you're coming from with that. How would you like me to respond to that? That gets back into what that person is thinking. If they say, you know, you have this idea to uh, implement a four-day work week. Well, that's stupid. Well, how would you like me to respond to that? Why do you feel that way? Because, and a lot of times people will just be resistant as kind of a default reaction that I say, say no to everything that I don't understand. It could be complaints. This is when you're talking to an employee, there are some performance problems, or there's some issues with your boss, and, and they start complaining about the process, the history, and everything else. Find out more. Put on your detective hat. Please tell me exactly what happened. How can we make this right? Ask for their help so it's not a, an us versus them, but you're working together to, again, resolve the issue. And then finally, it's shifting from the base problems to symptoms. The way you can tell the difference between a problem and a symptom is if you get rid of the symptom, the underlying problem pops up in another form, kind of like whack-a-mole. You have to get to what the root problem is. Once you can identify that problem, then you're in a better place to resolve what that problem is. Um, why do you do it this way? What does whatever really mean? Focus on the base problems. If you're having trouble with, um, with, with uh, retention or you have people who are leaving after 30 days or they're ghosting you, Instead of saying, oh, that's just the generation. Oh, that's just the way everybody is right now. That's a symptom. What's the underlying problem? Why did they choose to leave your organization? Do exit interviews. And if, and if you don't feel comfortable doing, outsource it to a, an HR consultant to find out what is really going on. Um, what I've found when I've done uh, ground, ground to theory scientific research uh, for organizations to identify what those root problems are. A lot of times what I discovered is what the senior leaders thought was the problem was not the problem. Um, one company, for example, was having uh, a lot of trouble uh, finding and retaining employees. 
what they just what I discovered was a lot of them didn't have cars. So they needed to catch a bus. And the bus stop was over a mile away from the organization. So the company started making changes to make it easier to eliminate that friction or that pain point that was preventing employees from coming to work. And what this all leads up to is how are you going to reduce your stress and avoid burnout so that you can get the most important things done at work? Now, remember, we talked about some systemic work uh, truth about the future of work. Now we're going to kind of look at these as systemic truths about work and burnout. Um, employees are people, not just workers. Uh, they have emotions. They're going to be respond emotionally. Um, and they're not just cogs in a wheel. The work is a subset of life, not separate from life. Um, in working with manufacturing companies, you know, the employees all complained that it was mandatory overtime and they let them know on a Friday that they had to work the weekend. So their home life was thrown up in the air and they couldn't do anything. It was a very simple fix. They did a calendar for the, the full month and the employees knew two weeks, two, three weeks in advance when they'd have to work overtime on a weekend. Make sure that you view uh, your employees' work as just a subset of their life. Um, and the value has to come through feelings and not just features. And, you know, we've talked a lot about how difficult HR is now. And considering the initial stats that I gave you, HR burnout is looming. And if you're burned out, you are not going to be able to really function. Which leads me to the BDOC model, which is the uh, scientifically research-based model that indicates how employees burn out. What I found in my research is that most of the people who burned out were not the ones who, it was just a job and I don't care. They were people who had high hope. They were high achievers. They wanted to do good work and they cared about the company. But through a combination of certain personality you know, at-risk personality traits, which, which we went over, and a variation of uh, one or more of the organizational stressors, they first became frustrated, then they got angry, and then they became totally apathetic. Apathy, quiet quitting, presenteeism. They're at work in body only, but they're not giving their full attention to work. They're not engaged. When it led into burnout manifestations, uh, a lot of times people don't admit that they're really fried until they have health problems. 15% of the people whom I interviewed were diagnosed with cancer six months after they left the job that was burning them out. Uh, it can be sleep disturbances suicide uh, ideation, uh, cardiovascular problems, gastrointestinal problems, uh, but it creates chronic um, physical malaise, okay? That's when they're burned out. And that's when they usually decide, hey, I'm going to do something about this. Recovery is through uh, either physical or psychological removal. Now, I said the quiet quitting can be apathy, Quiet quitting can also be that psychological removal that employees are quiet quitting because they are burned out and they're trying to feel better. Um, the physical removal would be turnover or termination. It then, <clears throat> excuse me, it then leads into a period of self-knowledge and acceptance, self-reflection to understand what your burnout triggers are, what you need to have a uh, a good experience at work, to be an engaged worker, to be able to do everything that you need to do. And then finally, after you go through that, you have a revised psychological uh, contract with work, which quite frankly is a fancy schmancy way of saying, I'm going to do this for the employer and I expect this in return. This takes us back to the new employee experience with the pandemic uh, or with the um, in the post-pandemic era. So this revised psychological contract would work. Not very sexy, right? 
when I did research on women in burnout, what I found is that the women who fully recovered went above this and they actually were achieving Maslow's level of self-actualization. They knew how to set boundaries. They did work that they love. They were able to organize their work. Uh, they felt fulfilled by what it was they were doing. And they ended up at a higher level of hope than before they burned out. As you can see in the original BDOC model, that revised psychological contract of work is at a lower level than hope. How fast does it take to burn out? Well, in, in terms of change, if you are a change leader, it can take about one to two years, okay? I think it's because you have more control. But if you feel that you're a change target, you can fry in six months. Hope, frustration, anger, apathy, burnout. Recovery takes about two years, whether you're a change target or you're a change leader. But that said, there's a problem, and that's this residual burnout. As you're moving through the stages of recovery from burnout, the physical or psychological removal, the self-knowledge and uh, acceptance, something can trigger you, and you're going to go right back into burnout, which might be frustration, anger, and apathy, or a full-blown burnout. I think that a lot of people after the pandemic are in this recovery. I think this is why a lot of uh, new hires, if the job is not what they expected, they quit because it's that psychological removal. I think it's why a lot of employees are now saying, no, no, I want more than this from a job. But that's the self-knowledge and acceptance. It takes, as I said, about two years to recover. But in my research on women in burnout, I talked to women who were five to 10 years out from that original burnout, and they just kept bouncing. They went, you know, they'd leave the job, they'd go to a new employer, they'd burn out again. They'd leave their field or industry and change careers, something happened, they burned out again. So it can take a very, very long time. And, you know, and when you're an HR, an HR department of one, the whole HR function is dependent on you. So I believe you have to do everything you can by setting up, you know, strategic goals, aligning your processes and priorities with that, and taking care of yourself so that you can complete the responsibilities in your job and in your department, because you do have an awful lot of responsibility on you. So here's 10 habits to reduce your stress and avoid burnout. And this will also help you make sure that you can get all of the numerous tasks, duties, and responsibilities completed in your job, do them well, feel fulfilled, and don't fry. First thing is, is to align the HR activities with the company's strategy and goals. Decide what can be omitted. Decide what you can delegate. Decide what you can um, push back. So I don't have to have it done this quarter. Honestly, this really doesn't need to be done to the second quarter of 2025. So align the actions with strategy and goals. Think strategically so that you can identify what needs to be done, the steps that are done on a daily tactical basis. Secondly, set those boundaries. Practice saying no and introduce time blocking, where you have a certain period of time where you can get the work done. A lot of companies, a lot of the major, major companies are offering time blocking for, for their employees to do reflective work, innovative work, so that they're not constantly being bombarded uh, with outside requests that take them off course. Third, eat the elephant in little bites. Break that project down into achievable steps. This can be eye-opening. If you look at a project like, okay, I need to revise the orientation program. I think it's going to take me five hours. Cool. Break down the steps and estimate the amount of time to do each step. You're going to have to review the current materials. You're probably going to have to review the evaluations of employees who have gone through it probably going to want to talk to managers and employees in terms of what the orientation was like. 
probably going to want to do some outside research. Then you're going to start compiling it all together, and then you're going to have to create. Now, remember how I said uh, to reuse things? It may be that instead of you doing it live all the time, you do it in small chunks, you have it on video, and it's on demand. Then you can do more one-on-one -on -one with the employees afterwards. OK, but if you break that, you know, revise the the orientation program, I think it's going to take five hours. If you have to go through all those steps, you quickly realize it ain't going to take five hours. It's going to take a lot more time. But at least that way you can respond to that request and say, I need this much time to do it. Give yourself um, a little bit of wiggle room in there. So. This is one of the ways that you have you can realistically estimate the time for projects. Add about 25% of the estimated amount of time to do a project for wiggle room. Because bottom line, stuff happens. Okay. And if you if you got yourself too tight in there and you miss a deadline, it's going to be uh, like a, a snowball effect. Everything else is going to have problems too. So add some wiggle room. Also, if it's a project for a senior leader, you've got that wiggle room and you get it done earlier, you look better that you got it done more quickly. Don't work over 60 hours a week. Uh, 60 hours is the tipping point for uh, not only burnout, but in Japan it's called kuroshi, which is literally death by overwork. Uh, it had become a major problem for the country that young employees were found dead at their desks. I'm not talking uh, rhetorically. I'm talking dead from heart attacks. The best thing to do is really look at what you have to do each week and plan those tasks for a 40-hour work week. Um, it's tough. I know but with, with all the things that I have with you know, with clients and with running the business and with teaching in universities, you know, you estimate the amount of time and then you add it up for the week and go, oh, great, it's a 70 hour work week. I'm not working a 70 hour work week. So you have to become very judicious and very surgical in terms of what needs to be done. What can you push off? What can you delegate? Try to plan your week for 40 hours. If you go a little bit over that, it's not that bad. But if you plan your week for at least 60 hours, there's going to be problems. Um, and streamline your processes with paper or digital. Make those files easy to find and access. Um, I do not remember, unfortunately, the exact statistic, but I believe there was a study that was done that when people can't find things due to disorganization, if you add up all the time lost, it's nearly one eight-hour day a week that you're just off. Is it easy to do? No, I'm still getting stuff organized here. But you need to be able to make the time to do it because if you you live by your priorities, um, what, you know, what gets measured gets done. But the big thing is if it's something is a priority, you find a way to get it done. If it's not a priority, you don't. And again, it's not a priority, delegate it, move it back, or omit it altogether. Understand your personal burnout triggers. Uh, what things in your personality, uh, what uh, issues in the company culture are triggers for you and decide how that you can respond to them or adapt. Number eight, stop playing Superman and Superwoman. Don't be afraid to admit that you're stressed out. Uh, when I was interviewing women for the Women in Burnout um, research, I had one woman who was a superwoman, you know, married, had kids. She was an, uh, a, a triathlete. She was a director. Everybody loved her. And they were having a town hall meeting that the CEO held, I think, every three to six months. And everybody was all happy, happy. You know, everything's great. And she was fried. Uh, to give you an idea how fried she was, she was grinding her teeth at night so badly that she developed bone spurs in her jaw, bone spurs. So she decided to tell, you know, when it was her turn to talk in this town hall, she admitted how burned out she was. Well, there was initially a collective gasp, like, oh, I can't believe you're burned out. Oh, my God. But then afterwards, 
first of all, she thought she had lost her job. But what happened instead is that employees came up to her and said, oh my God, you're burned out. I am too. How are you dealing with it? The next step should have been to get employees coming together to change things within the workplace to avoid burnout. Because I'm telling you, when people burn out, they leave. Sometimes they sabotage the company before they go, but they leave, which adds more stress to all of you guys to recruit replacements and to deal with the ret their retention and engagement. Another thing is, uh, I love this from Stephen Covey, schedule your priorities, don't prioritize your schedule. Write that on your whiteboard, tattoo it on your arm, schedule your priorities. Don't look at all the stuff you have to do and then try to prioritize that schedule. Start with the priorities and create the schedule from that. Um, I found that's probably one of the best ways to ensure that what's important actually gets done. And then unapologetically, that's the key word here, unapologetically take time off to re-energize. Because PTO is for HR too. It's not just for everybody else. You can then be a role model for the way that you can be a star performer, a happy uh, employee, and you're not burned out. So if you do all these tips um, strategically and operationally and take time for yourself, you can bring that human back into HR for the employees in your workforce, as well as for you. You can become the role model. HR is in a pivotal point right now as we move from business as usual to creating the new normal. And I'm gonna tell you, if you create a new normal in your organization that people enjoy coming to work, they feel recognized, they do great work, you're gonna have an engaged workforce and it's going to make it a lot easier to recruit, retain, and engage employees and make sure that the company achieves its strategic goals. So um, this is me. Feel free to reach out to me. Uh, Patty, I, I, if you could send me the emails, I'll be glad to send the slide deck to everyone. And let's open it now to some Q&A. Great presentation, Jerry. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you. I think um, a lot of what you talked about really resonated with myself and a couple of the other members were texting me in between and <laughs> definitely hit home for us. What do you think was the is the was the most challenging? Or what was one of your key takeaways? I'm curious. For me, when you started talking about prioritizing, I'm trying to find a way to um, get out of working in the business and focusing on the business and more strategic. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's hard when you're a department of one to balance that. Exactly. And I think the other thing, what I've seen with HR is we're dealing with people. Okay. People never do what you think they're going to do. You know, whereas, oh, if you're in ops, even though people are involved, you can do all the spreadsheets and the Gantt charts and everything else. Um, if you're in finance, everything can be reduced to a number. It gets rid of that emotional thing. And sometimes HR professionals have difficulty giving the return on the investment for what it is that they're doing. The with them, the so what. Because oftentimes senior leaders are like, well, People should be happy they got a job. I mean, I have to make them engage. There's a big change that has gone on. Part of it's the new generation uh, the, that's in the workplace. But the other thing is it's post-pandemic. It, it changed all of us. I mean, when I think back to how many years we were wearing masks, I mean, years. Think about it now. You know, when we were in the heat of it, we did it. But looking back, it's like, how many years did we do that? Yeah, it's it's stressful. It's stressful. Any yeah. other takeaways that any of you have? And I don't see any of your smiling faces, unfortunately. Okay. 
a wonderful presentation. Are you able to put your contact info back up? Sure. Let me go over here. While you're doing that, Jerry, um, so Jerry's presentation, Mastering HR in a Department of One, did qualify for 1.5 professional development credits. Um, I will send that to Jerry and she can send email the certifi uh, certificate with the presentation. Thank but you. if you want to jot these down, the SHRM Continuing Education credit number is 24 dash G as in girl, 3 D as in David, M as in Mary, and 6. That's Thanks. the SHRM credit. And Thanks. then HRCI credit. Mm -hmm is six eight three three six six okay that's the hrci do note on the hrci because i was burnt out i added the credits this morning so you have to use tomorrow's date for the hrci credit and i put that in the certification okay so sounds good and by all means, uh, feel free to link in with me. And by the way, the TEDx talk is over 700,000 views now, which is mind blowing to me. And um, the other thing is, you know, the the websites, I'm one of my big kahuna projects is I'm totally changing everything to get everything onto one unified website. That's yeah. been, <laughs> that's been fun. Yep. There's one question in the chat, Jerry, yeah. from uh, Marlon. Okay. And he is asking, how do I let senior leaders know they are too close to the day-to-day -to -day things happening on the floor? Oh, God. You got they the are requesting that I get involved to solve the problem. Uh, they're asking you to solve the problem, but ask them what the problem is because it could be part of the problem is the fact that they're too close with everything. And depending on the way the culture is, you know, with some companies, depending on the side, the, the CEO and line workers are almost on the same level, okay? With others, it's like CEOs up here, line workers are down here. So they're they're gonna be very intimidated if that, if that person comes on. Um, when talking to him, uh, be a detective. Ask what he thinks the problems are. You know, why are these problems? What is the result from them? So really look into it as uh, trying to understand what their point of view is. Uh, they may push back. They may push back. But for you to keep reinforcing that for me to solve the problem rather than the symptom, uh, it will enable me to, to solve it more quickly and also to, to take the right action so there won't be any pushback. Does that help, Marlon? Okay. And I'll tell you what, I'm gonna go ahead and stop recording too.